All right, everybody. It's the Jerry Metcalf podcast where top real estate agents tell how they do it. And we have for round four, Jason O'Neill from Carmel, Indiana with Circle Real Estate. Good friend, this man, everybody, and I'm going to let you say hi. I just have to say, you always have, we just had you on a call with the Breakthrough Luxury Coaching that we're doing, talking about subtle shifts that make big outcomes, because every interview with you, there are always those things that have just stuck for life. That being said, Jason, it's so oh. awesome to have you again. Thanks. Thank you. All right. It is 2024. January, we're going to release, you know, in the next couple of weeks, this interview, as we think about it, we've gone through, I mean, a lot of us lived through the Great Recession, then the market kind of stabilized, then we hit COVID, then now we're, it's like the market is definitely shifting. All of that being said, you're running a, an amazing boutique brokerage in Carmel, Indiana, that has the network, the connections, and is doing some really powerful deals where we, as we look at that i'd love to talk a little bit about where you are now where things are now and where things are going yeah so um i, I love our conversations and we get it i'll share with the people that listen to this we got a chance to rehash some of the uh the other three um podcasts that we've done and it brought back some really good memories and like it does show like where we've been and where we're going it's all been kind of documented here which is super cool why don't uh, I read that? You want me to read those real quickly for yeah. what, what, Let's do that. So yeah. by the way, let's do let everybody know what episodes, Jason. So we had, I, well, we met at G&E and I remember I heard you speak at a global networking event for um, Sotheby's International Realty when you, because you were with them for quite a while. Yeah, we met like, it hasn't been 10 years, but it's been a while. And again, your attention to the little things that make a big difference. So soon after that, you were on episode 52, selling versus marketing. It's about relationships. Yeah. Episode number 99, success. It's not how, but who. In episode 227, y'all are going to love this. The three C's to build your business and your brand. And those are? Should, you want Clarity, confidence, and commitment. Love it. Well, we can talk more about that. But yeah, I mean, all of this is is a genesis of, um, you know, things that I've done right and things that I've done wrong that have worked and that, that haven't worked that just kind of keep building on themselves, right? Like, it's not super complicated, but you take more of what works and do more of that and do less of what doesn't. Um, there, there's a book, I don't know that you need to read the book, but it's called Designing Your Life. I think um, it was maybe a Stanford professor that one of his uh, students kept publishing their notes, but it's basically about taking a, um, a software design approach to like life. And so I just kind of like take that to business, right? So the software design approach is like to your life is, hey, you know, I don't know if I want to be a vegetarian, but you know, I'll try to eat vegetarian stuff. And if I like it, I'll keep doing it. If I don't, I'll stop. Hmm. So, so does that, yeah. yeah. So it is, and that's what like built everything. So I, I'm, I'm, Got a big smile on my face when you're talking about, you know, it's not how, but who. So our first core value um, in my company is the first focus on who. And, and it like, it reverberates to everything, whether, you know, it's, it's an agent, whether it's a team member, whether it's a buyer, whether it's a seller, here's where it's really helped us over the past few years is, you know, one of the, we're always focused on our buyers, right? As a who, but who are we buying the house from? Who's the agent? Who's the seller? What do they want out of the transaction, right? And by focusing on that and helping the buyers say, okay, like, you know, obtaining the asset, obtaining the property is, is really, really important. Not, you know, we're not going to talk about a, a few dollars here, but, you know, what is the seller's timeline? Do they have a preferred uh, lawyer, title company, escrow company? Uh, you know, what's important to them? Well, if a couple of things come to mind in that, it's like, everybody's like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Well, number one, get off of what, focus who the person is, what's in it for them, and what they're looking for, because that's where it's supply and demand, the demand is there, and number, or, or is it not? And number two is look for what I don't know. Hey, and look for what I don't know, and then look for who does know it, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got an ad, I wish I could show it to you, I can send you a copy of it, but it's running in our uh, local magazine now, and it's been running for about three months. And it's a, it's a couple sitting at their, uh, at their center island drinking coffee. And it says, 
you know, how will we navigate today's real estate market? And then in Sharpie, they cross off, uh, how will we? And it says, who will help us? Right. Mm, and then that's yeah. our, strength, and our value proposition is that because I, I have found that um, whether it's home buyers, sellers, agents, when you're focused, and I think this is what we talked about, if I recall correctly, when you're focused on the how, it's burdensome, right? It's it's hard, it's weighty. But once you start to think about who, like it's like a how many times have you been like stuck on a problem? You're like, oh my gosh, Jerry can help me with this or Jason can help me with this. And you pick up the phone and call somebody and you're like, wow, I feel lighter and faster. You know, they know I don't have to figure this out. I don't have to learn this. And there's something that really comes in with the who that we all know, but I think it's worth saying is trust. Mm -hmm. And what consists of trust? There's a lot of words that come to mind, but a, a quick one is, character and confidence or another way of saying it. I don't know if you've heard about the book story brand. Yeah, of course. I am. Have you read it? Um, I, I've, I've read a part of it. it. It's, been, I've it's, read been the, recomm- it's been recommended to me by somebody I, I trust a ton. So I got to read the whole thing. I've read, I've read, I've been through half of it and it's so good. I just start applying it. But the concept, the concept is, as you know, <clears throat> um, like, oh, like who's the hero? It's not you. It's the client. Who's the main character? everybody's the main character of their own story. Like when you're watching Superman, like it's Superman has a guide. That's who we are. Right. They are the hero. Now we're back into, let's bring that back into the who is, who are we, what is our role to play in this game? And, and, and how does this all work and how does it come together? And a really big one is again, when I think of who it's not just the steps of getting it done. It's the fact that I know, I don't know. And I know this is who I can trust. Uh, character confidence. I went back to story brand. Let me, I didn't finish that. What he says in place of character and competence, he says, um, oh, now, cause I know it so well, I don't know it anymore, but he's, there's the guide and it's someone who do empathy and authority. Yeah. Well, and that's, so you take those two things, right? Um, and again, I feel bad I haven't finished the book, but I'm, I'm thinking I'm caught up to speed on it. I certainly know about real estate. Um, We're both going to finish it and talk about it again, right? Yeah. So you, you want to really dig down into what makes a difference in a listing presentation. It's those two things. It's it's empathy and authority. So any any reasonable study that's been done, it always comes down to empathy, whether even you know, sellers or homeowners know the word empathy or they use it. It's that, you know, their, their guide, their real estate agents that, that is there empathizes with, with their unique situation. Right. So that's how you build trust. Physicians, lawyers, same thing. They understand what yours, again, the who, right. And then authority and authority doesn't mean authoritarian, right. It means that, Hey, I'm in charge of this one aspect. Right. We're going to collaborate on it a little bit together in terms of, you know, what needs to be done and negotiations and whatnot. But like this is this is my wheelhouse. And that mm. starts and that starts when the if you go to their house for a, a marketing consultation, when the door opens. I mean, I can't tell you the amount of times that, you know, an agent is there staring at a seller and they're they're nervous because they're at somebody's house for the first time. And it's weird when you're a guest in somebody's house for the first time. But it can't be weird because you're the authority and they're looking to you to be the authority and they're looking exactly. to be the guide. Well, it's like, right? so it's like, it's like said, people, said, where should we start? They're like, I don't know. That's what you're here for. Right. And then it's because a few things, it, it's like, stop looking at it from our perspective. Look at it from, and this is going to go full circle where we started. What is the perspective of the client, the customer, the other person living from that place? to understand what you, what you offer at the table, because you come in as a guide adding to that. This is just coming, this is coming straight from the book, the story brand. He talks about when you watch the movie, the main character, the client, the hero, they're the ones who always struggle as the realtor. How many realtors think of their job as a struggle? Our job is to be the guide with authority and empathy their job, and then I'll quote Chris Voss for a minute. I think he says something like, as I always do, but let them get out of their own way. Let them solve, give them this, the autonomy, the sense of autonomy and freedom to get out of their own way. 
or or to solve their own actually even get, solve their own problem but it's giving them that space where they're safe to do it with the guide who has the empathy and authority to get them there yeah yeah it's but everything it, it, you said i'm just i'm just revalidating it with all the books but <laughs> go ahead no but it's 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 so important it's so important and um yeah that's where like so I think we started off talking about the who, but like who you're dealing with is is super important. And then, you know, you are their who too. So it becomes a symbiotic relationship. Well, and what's interesting about it is we're all, well, I say we, I'm not selling anymore. I am all coaching now, but we're all looking at as agents, you know, what, 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 what. And when we go realign to the who, there is so much magic is also shifts us from this mindset of scarcity of there's not enough. So if, if you look at the market in general, there's way too much when you know who and how is in how you're the best in the world for who suddenly you create a market where there is an abundance of opportunity and an abundance of, of deals or whatever your goal is for your business. Yeah. And, and helping people, right? Like helping people get what they want because that becomes you know, and you talked about so one of my big value propositions is, um, and we we talked about this. We can touch on it. Um, the the three C's, right? So one of my things is, and this this started years ago. I, I pulled a bunch of my past clients and said, "What did what you actually pay me for?" Right. And so now, like anytime oh, that, people that was a good. What did, can you say that question again for yeah. everybody? I want to make did, sure they're what, listening. What, what did Great you question. Actually, what did you actually pay me for? You know, and so nowadays, if I meet with somebody new, I'll ask a, a home seller, what do you think you pay a real estate broker for? And there's a, they all give the same answers, right? It's a tax. I have to, I don't want to. If my wife would let me put a for sale sign, for, for sale by owner sign up, I would, but then the neighbors think I'm cheap, right? Like it's, it's it's a myriad of answers but then i go on to explain to them like i explained to you that like you know a number of years ago i got really really serious about this and rolled my sleeves up and i pulled a bunch of past clients that we that i knew i trusted and i trust their business acumen and i distilled it down to three things right clarity confidence and commitment so clarity we bring clarity to situations that are otherwise unclear right how do i sell this house, buy a new house and not be homeless and not own two houses for very long, right? That's a, it's a weighty situation, right? So again, clarity, we're the who. Confidence. Confidence isn't something you show up at a front door with. Confidence is something you give. And that's, so a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about subtle mindset mm. shifts. So giving confidence as opposed to being confident is the, A, the ultimate form of confidence, but B, it's like, it's, that's real, right? And that's where the, um, the reality comes from. And by that, I mean, and you were talking about trust. That's where, where trust and authority and empathy come in because everybody's hired somebody to do a job and they just don't show up, right? Or they do a sloppy job. Now, you can't do your coaching job because you're following up in the guy in the deck being like, well, hey, my neighbors use screws and you're using nails. Like, and- how come you're not here at you said to be here at nine it's 10 30 right you lose confidence real quick so by giving somebody confidence that builds the authority the trust right and, and then ultimately commitment somebody wants somebody who's going to commit to their unique situation and you know what we're real estate brokers most are realtors this applies to physicians attorneys anybody financial planners anybody that's in a professional business like I, I would encourage them to think about it what do you sell what does somebody pay for what are you selling and now the magic of what i'm talking about back to you know the the listeners here is i'm not talking about anything that's a commodity i'm not talking about aerial videos or um you know professional photography or marketing or how great i am right i'm talking about things that are not commoditized because at the end of the day, you know, the market gets super hot. A home seller is going to be like, well, you don't need to spend three, $400 on pictures. Um, my brother's a photographer. Why don't we take them and then just knock that off your fee? 
right? Or the house is going to sell quick. So your hourly rate should be different. Well, I mean, oh, we can make it take longer hour, if you want. Right? Yeah, we can make <laughs> it take longer if you want. I love that. We can take longer if you want. Jerry, I, I had that happen one time. So we sold this, sold this guy's house and it went, it went well. And um, I think it was, I feel like it was a girlfriend, maybe a wife, girlfriend. I was like, oh, where's, you know, so-and-so? How come she didn't come to the, the closing? He's like, you know what? She wasn't happy with you. I'm like, what? Why are you not happy with me? She's like, you know, you got paid a big fee and the house sold in like less than a week. I'm like, did she want me to have it take longer? God, I love that response. We could have taken longer. And then, you know, he and, right? I, got a, he and I got a chuckle in the parking lot, but I was like, gosh, I mean, I definitely didn't do the best job on that. Right? Like, well, if it would have taken a year and then not so, you could have just paid me for that, but maybe but not. Those are, but those are, the, those are the three Cs. And, and when you, you know, when your value, I do think when your value is based on time and effort, somebody's always going to try to get you to do it faster and with less effort. Right. They, that's just that's human nature. So but when your value is based on things that right can't be commoditized and really shouldn't be. Then exactly. Limitless. Well, that, that, this has been in my mind from the beginning of the interview, because I just know things. But this leads right into that is, um, you know, you, for example, can we talk about the art gallery? Yeah. Yeah. And that goes into everybody, I have to digress for a minute. I want to talk about the art gallery. That also goes into relationships. Love to say one thing that you said about clarity. I think it's so huge. And I find it's something we can all just remember is people pay sometimes as experts, we want to make it complicated and pull out all the spreadsheets and use fancy words. But they're not paying us for that. They're paying us for that knowledge we have maybe to be able to do that. But what they're really paying us for is to be able to take all of that knowledge and make it real clear. Right? Like, you're and paying think, me to know what to pull out, lay out, and help me make the decision and do the right thing. And I think that, and I think that you've got to um, have that information at least at at your disposal. But I don't think you need to overwhelm people with it. So exactly, uh, there are there. Are, I happen to work with three different financial advisors, and that sounds fancy, but it's not. Two are great referral partners, and one is um, my uncle that manages an account. Um, you know. The one guy is like, wants to do a dream planner and all this stuff. I'm like, do you really care if I want to own a vineyard? Like, does it, and we're high school friends. I'm like, come on, man, I'm not going to, I'm going to do a 20 page worksheet for you. But my uncle who manages an account, he, like, he doesn't ask questions. He's like, I just assume you want to make, you know, us to perform as well as possible. Right. Risk. But the guy that, the guy that gets really technical, he'll forward me technical documents all the time. And I don't even read it. And I had to pull him aside. I'm like, look, man, that I don't, I'm not reading that stuff. Like, what are you getting paid for? Manage the money. Like, if this is a pat on the back. So, so I do think that, you know, you need to know that, that, that your agent has the spreadsheet and has looked at the stuff, but we know as agents that a lot of it is, is, is gut too, when it comes to pricing. Well, well, exactly. It's like, I'm not paying you to show me all the fancy stuff. I'm paying you to make it clear. Let's like mastery right. is clarity. Right. That's actually like a quote from somebody in effect. Information. Right? The information. Here it is. And this let's is what pull out, let's clean this up. Like I remember doing CMAs and the biggest part of the CMA is truly understanding what the what the selling points were of a house and what you understood about that could drive the house up or down as well as a listing agent which is back to clarity and seller needs right like i do think i, I do know that and sorry i think we're getting sidetracked here but yeah this is good i have a feeling i'm interested anyway it's good. Well, it, most most sellers um have a number in mind and and they think that the number is the most important thing agents, if you really think about it, know that timing is probably is more important than, than the number. And if you understand, if you can get a really, really good grasp on, on seller timing and motivation, helping them get to it, then you will be much, much, much better at pricing. So here's, here's what I say. So I've, I've found that there are three things that motivate, uh, that really drive sellers while they're, you know, selling a house price, timing, and urgency. So they, they might sound similar, but they're not. So price is price, right? Like we need to we need to net or gross a certain dollar amount here, or we want to, right? 
timing is our new house is being done, job transfers happening, kids school starting, whatever. Like we want to be, we want to be out of this house or into a new house in a certain time period. Urgency is make this problem go away now, right? And, and you never want to get to urgency. But as agents, like I do know agents that that's a strategy, right? Like they don't really get into the timing thing. They'll price it high and then they'll just kind of wait for the market to catch up or wait for people to get frustrated enough and strategically lower the, the price until, you know, people are frustrated. And, and pray they don't get fired. Because so often when you don't address that urgency up front, it's when yeah. you lose listings. So, but having that conversation of, you know, hey, hey, Jerry, so what I've found is that there are, there are three things that really drive people selling a house. Price, timing, urgency. And then I'll explain it the same way I just did with you. Price is a number. Timing is a specific time period. Urgency is make it go away now. We don't want to get to urgency. Uh, but these three things, like they move and they kind of change positions. Where's your head now? What's, what's important? And now you're going to have a real conversation about, um, yeah, you know what? And so then I'll do, well, no, $2 million is the most important thing. Not 1.9, $2 million. Okay. So if I get you an offer of $2 million tomorrow, can you be out by the end of the week? No. Okay. So what would that look like? Well, that would have to be way more than $2 million or that's impossible, right? We don't have anywhere to go. Okay. So like we've got to factor in all the components of, of a buyer's offer because it's not, it's not always realistic. So understanding timing is huge. And well, getting, I, helping, well, them, helping them because when, when a seller calls you, right, they, they might have an idea, but they don't understand the importance in the overall picture. Well, there, it was interesting that you just pointed out pretty much is like, even when you ask those questions, remembering that sellers have their own version of reality and they're not nearly as familiar with what it means to sell a house as usually we are as agents. And um, they're answering the question in a context that we might like notice you just said, so $2 million. So if I, so most agents, would, we would leave it at that. Okay, $2 million. And then you said, if I brought that to you next week, going into time, would that be too soon? Well, actually it wouldn't, the price would just have to be higher. Yeah, it was, which wags into the, their answer. They're even assuming things on the questions you're asking and taking it a level deeper to just get all of this stuff to the surface. So we can really serve our clients well and have the kind of relationship to build, get deals closed and build more business. So it all generally followed up with, okay, so, you know, the, again, these three things move. So I'm going to be checking in with you every week, every other week. And, you know, hey, where's your head, Jerry? Price, timing, urgency, how we doing? Right. So, but, but now think about it this way. So I'm doing multiple things at the same time here. Now, if I have a house that let's say they, they want them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you another strategy of mine. <clears throat> Hear me use a firm number with a buyer or seller. I'll always say something that feels like $2 million. Because people, right, dates and numbers stick in people's head. Well, you said $2 million, Jason. Like, 1971, what's the difference? <laughs> yeah, $19,000, that's the difference. Right. $19,000, whatever. Um, right. But, you know, it's uh, something that feels like $2 million. And I found that that, and it's, it's going to sound like it's, you know, maybe I have commitment issues, who knows, but it's, it's less of a commitment to a number. It's and the recognition that you don't have the crystal eight ball. So I, yeah. I don't have the crystal ball. And I don't know if they want the, the pool vacuum or your rugs or, you know, some other stuff, or I don't know if they want you to move next week or in six months. So something that feels like $2 million. The other thing is, we know as agents that if you tell me on the timing side, you'd like something that feels like $2 million and you want to move in, um, and you want to close in six months or move or be out in six months versus you want to be out in 30 days. So now those are two completely different pricing strategies. So now having that conversation with the seller, I'm using terms like pricing strategy based on your timing that's automatically going to set me apart of whoever they're, else they're interviewing. And it's based on their needs, not how awesome you might think that you are or be trying to convince them you are because no one wants to be convinced of anything because that means you think they're wrong. Right. Which, and, and I'm just, I'm more focused on the solution, but I can't, 
I can't provide the solution unless I understand all of the components to the transaction. And this falls, here's what this is pulling back circle, full, full circle to is, is two things is assumptions, like consider what we're assuming and how unaware we often are of what we're assuming and the exact same thing for our clients, what they're assuming and underwear they're assuming and what we're assuming about them that we're unaware of, right? And then, so looking at the assumptions and then the part number two is, what are the questions? Pausing, focusing, understanding our assumptions and the other assumptions and getting around the questions as I love to quote the book, A More Beautiful Question. If Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem. I was gonna, I was gonna quote this, yes. I, it even says, I reckon, I don't know that Einstein said I reckon, maybe he did, but I reckon I'd spend 55 minutes making sure I'm, and I find this wording so uh, intentional, it's got to be answering. There are lots of questions we can ask, like, why is this so hard? Anyway, like, that's not a good, no. Answering, what are the questions we should be answering? Like, really asking the questions that we really need the answers to. And that comes from an acknowledgement of what we might might be assuming yeah. in the other party. Yeah. Assumptions so, and questions. I'm understanding a question is yeah, that's that's the awareness, right? Awareness of assumptions and questions. But what you go back, so you were just talking about understanding. Understanding their situation and, and timing and really defining what 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 problem are we actually solving. Ooh. And my I, two favorite questions of yours are what are you really paying me for and what problems are we actually solving yeah i mean they're 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 good ones right like why am i and and um why, yeah why why am i here right like and it's not just to get you a purchase contract on your house there's so much more that goes into it these mm -hmm. are there's Stressful, stressful situation. Hey, two questions come to mind. So I'll ask, I am going to ask them at the same time. One is on that topic of the confidence first, I mean, not confidence, the topic of clarity, confidence. Oh my gosh. And commitment. No, timing. I'm sorry. I'm looking at notes right now and I should be just focused, but trust, authority, and empathy. S that's not it either. Y'all just bear with Jerry Metcalf for a minute. Price, timing, and urgency. I'm reading instead of whatever, but price, timing, and urgency. Those three things. Um, there are situations, I, I think, where sometimes we don't realize how urgent it is, like they're holding back a little bit. In those situations, have you ever run into that where you came in thinking one thing and walked out learning that this thing has to be sold tomorrow or it didn't come to surface until you really dug in and asked the right questions. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you two stories. Um, uh, one is how I came up with price timing urgency. Remember, like I said, so everything is building on my past experiences. So, um, and I'll make this as short as I can, but so I go to list these people's house and they're like, you know, $600,000. That's it. Bottom line. Not a penny, not a penny less not 599 jason and i'm like okay well let's just put together a strategy to to do that and somehow about like 45 days later i get a call from the the wife and the the couple and she's like what have you done to sell my house today i'm like what am i what I'm playing golf what are you talking about right like in the mls um and she's like no jason let me tell you about my day right like i've got two kids and a dog they're in this house, they have soccer practice, baseball practice, math homework, and I've got to get these two kids and the dog out of the house, make sure nobody goes to the bathroom in the house, nobody leaves fingerprints on that countertop, just to have somebody say that they don't want to live in our neighborhood. Meanwhile, my husband's in Denver in an apartment eating chicken wings. I want my family together now. Like, look, 600,000, like we're now, Jason, now, right? So all of a sudden, urgency was paramount because he had took a job transfer. She was supposed to like stay behind and sell the house and you know, another 30, $40,000 was way less important than her having her family together and moving on with the next chapter of their life. So that happens if you don't really kind of 
dig deep into the situation. The other one, um, I had a, I did have a situation where these people, um, there was the first big transaction that I ever did. And um, there's a lot of really good stories with it, but it was a $2 million transaction. And um, I represent the seller, somebody else represented the buyer, some stuff went sideways afterwards. So I kind of kept the people on my mailing list. I think I dropped off a bottle of wine and, you know, some gift cards to a pizza place. And I had to drop off a check on behalf of the, uh, the seller. So um, that happened. And about a year or two later, the people called me up and said, Hey, you know, can you come meet with us to sell our house? And so, you know, the, we've talked about the book, let's get real or let's not talk. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm more predisposed to have the hard conversations up first. And I'm going to pause for a second. So I'll give you one of the hard ones that, that, you know, has changed my, my career. Um, you know, okay. Yeah. I'll, you know, this isn't these people, but yeah, I'll come over. Um, I'm going to go to somebody's house, but okay, look, Jerry sold you the house. Um, she's a good agent. Why'd you call me? It, it, is it just a price check? If it's just a price check. I'll give you a price on your house and, you know, have a preview of it. Maybe we can find a buyer, but what's going on? Well, you know what? We had a falling out. My wife played tennis against her and she called a ball out. It was clearly it. But, you know, like, don't pretend like you don't know that they, that they had their house, that they used an agent that's a really reputable agent to buy the house. You, you got to be like, hey, I, I know you use Jerry. Why don't you call her? That's right. a, that's he. So what was so what like when that ha what, what happens? What do you oh, find out? People will talk, right? Like, oh, exactly. you know, we, we, we like her. Um, you know, things got a little sideways. I don't know that the communication was the best. We're probably going to interview her, but you know, our friends across the street used you, so we want to interview you too. All right, like, well, cool. they'll, well, to your point, they'll go into detail. A lot of times they'll go into detail about what they might have been disappointed in with the other agent, which you can learn from, and what they're excited about you, which you can learn from, save time, and get back into the questions and avoid the wrong assumptions or false yeah, assumptions. And if it's just a price check, then I get 45 minutes of my day back, right? But so with these people that I'm talking about, so I sold the big house. That, do not lose your thought because that's really valuable what you just said when you do that ask that honest question have that kind of a conversation it brings authenticity to the conversation that i find when you do that those people are going to go back and use their agent that agent will appreciate you because you did it and it's funny how you will get people will share that story and it will reinforce business coming your way from that experience where people think that was a loss yeah like i said the book is called let's get real or let's not talk Right, like I have not read that one. Let's get real. Let's not talk. We got to read that now. You were going into another story for us. Don't I don't want you to lose people, your train of thought on that. People called me about eighteen. I think it was twelve months, eighteen months after they they bought the house, and this was this would have been at that point two thousand eight, two thousand seven, two thousand sixteen, two thousand seventeen. So not a not a terribly bad market. Um, so I sit down with them, and I don't need to tour the house because I sold it to them. Um, and I was present when they looked at it on multiple occasions. And, uh, I said, look, I got to tell you, um, we're not going to be able to sell this for what you paid for it. Not and fine. they, and they said, we know Jason, that's why you're here. And I mean, mm. I think they felt like they ultimately felt like that their agent got steamrolled um in the first negotiations and i ended up getting both sides of the deal i just I named this i represented them as a seller and then i represented the buyer what we're talking about in this whole conversation is how to get real and get it done yeah well it's easier right so much easier well here, here's a question that and we're going to talk about that art gallery, but I think this, this is, I have found this stuff in my life and business to be the bar none, the most valuable. I remember, um, obviously I was an agent for 18 or 19 years and you, you come to this business and everybody talks about being really nice and scripting people. And need, I, I believe that being nice should be a way of life, not a business strategy. And scripting people means you're not listening and you're assuming that you have no value other than to manipulate. And if you manipulate, to manipulate is really just to lie. But anyway, 
but as I'm getting in this business and, and winning business, I'm, I remember finding, and this is getting to the point, is that there's something about this business where we just want to get to the sale and we're afraid of the truth. And it's so scary. We'd rather just keep figuring out what to say and what to do rather than the who, which is where we started this whole interview or conversation today. In your business, how did you, and this may be more of a woman thing than a man thing, but like to be a sexist, but how did you, how did you get into that space where you could just get that real with people and know how and when and where to meet them? I didn't wake up that one day like that, right? I mean, there's a, there's a philosophy. I'm not saying that you subscribe to it, but it's called, if you're skating on thin ice, skate fast, which is true. Like, I just don't get on thin ice. <laughs> right? And it's, well, then that's the, when we talked about this, and we can talk about the yellow lights theory too, but it's kind of like that, right? Like um, when people see a yellow light, more often than not, they, they speed up. This is from that book, Let's Get Real or Let's Not Talk. Um, the yellow lights theory is people see a yellow light in the car and oftentimes they speed up to make it through when in fact, what you're taught you should do is hit the brakes, you know, slow down and stop and, you know, let the traffic go. Um, and there are yellow lights all the time and people wait in sales or relationships that people just want to skate through, right? They start talking fast versus, you know, in the, the example that I've used is, you know, Hey, we're, you know, we're, we're only going to pay X amount of commission. Right. And so a, a typical agent or typical scripting would be like, well, you know, we offer X amount of value and this our sales price is this and our record is this. And, you know, you're only going to focus on the net. And at the end of the day, you're going to net more, blah, blah, blah. Move on versus saying, well, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, you know, uh, our fee structure is set up like this and it's set up like this for um, for a reason. And we've got some metrics that, that back it up. Is that going to be a problem or should we move on? So we know that that's either a problem and we have a major problem or we can, we can move on. And that happens with anything, but you know, do you do open houses? We don't do open houses. We found that most qualified buyers, especially in your price point, um, want to schedule a private appointment. More often than not, they're represented by somebody. They've engaged a uh, real estate professional. And that way we have a chance to vet the people that are walking through your house. Had some bad experiences of people wanting to use just stopping to use the restroom after a ball game. Um, so we don't do open houses. Is that going to be a problem or should we move on? Can we move on? However you, you want to say it. Um, but you know, what, what happened is you were asking the question, I was thinking about that exact same transaction. I said, you know, we're not gonna be able to get you what you got. I ended up getting um, both sides of the transaction. Um, so I had knowledge that um, there was some, uh, uh, window rot in the house, pretty significant. In fact, the, the the seller previously had compensated the current owners to do the work. They never did the work, right? Yeah. So um, I am representing a buyer now uh, and, and the seller, which is always a, a dicey situation. And I had to, I brought a, my contractor out that does a ton of work. And I said, we need to talk about the windows. I've never seen a contractor so nervous like he was terrified i'm like look we're not hiding anything here i want you to be a hundred percent straightforward with the buyer these are huge commission dollars on the line right um i, I want to make sure that they know exactly what they're buying right i'm representing the buyer and the seller like there's no i don't want any funny business here and like they they, they understood right they they felt there was still value there. And so like being, being real, it's so often it's, you know, well, the, um, the buyer's agent asked for this to be fixed and we opened up the wall and it's a disaster. Well, they didn't ask for anything behind the wall. So just fix what they asked for. Right? You don't do that. Like do it the way you would want it done. Then it, it makes a difference. Well, well, it's, I say, it's, it's funny how, people really want a great reputation and when you slow down and look at your character and doing the right thing by everybody it's amazing how it comes around tenfold with reputation good deals more clients just tenfold all of that yeah and it's and it's amazing how um it works opposite too 
So mm-hmm. uh, on the positive side, I'll tell you in, in 2021, when the market was, was crazy, I mean, I didn't, I don't do a, a ton of deals. Mine are just higher priced. I think maybe we did like 45 or 50. That's, that's a lot of deals, but yeah. I didn't, Jerry, in 2021, I did not lose a buyer contract. Wow. Everybody was, so everybody just remember 2021 was when everything had 20 offers or 50 offers or whatever. Tell us a little. And I'll bet you it was like 15, 15 different buyers at various price points. Um, and again, the, like the. Hey, tell me about that. I wasn't dealing with first time home buyers either. Yeah, I did the opposite of what you did. I just did. Well, our team had, our team had about 80 closings. I had mostly listings. I mean, I think we had did maybe 10% listings and my personal business was 49 listings and two buyers. Is it just as an example? Like I was like, let's just, we can do listings, but 15, so tell us about just like, I didn't even deal with that. So, well, how did you deal? So what did you do? So one, they're, you know, fantastic conversations with the buyers, right? Like, and so there might've been times we didn't put an offer in, right? But do you want to buy this house? Do you want to own it? Yeah. At any questions. Yeah. At, okay. At, but you want me to tell you what to do to buy it? Right. Like the easiest, the easiest <sighs> shortcut, the, I mean, the, the fastest shortcut in a competitive situation is to overpay. Like I'm going to be completely straightforward with you. That's the shortcut. Do you want to do that? Yeah, I, I do. Right. But more than that, like when I, I call up the, other brokers and if they had 15 offers i mean i I know most of them i've got a good reputation hey you know so and so my buyers they they want to buy it and they're they're qualified either their cash or their finance and i'd explain why right like they could pay cash but why would they pass up three percent money so they're going to get a loan but they'll make it not contingent on financing um you know if you want to just let me know where to be I can tell you yes or no in about 10 minutes and we'll get it to you. They won't ever pay. And, and you know me, if I say it's good, if I say they're going to close on it, they're going to close on it. Which goes back to your who. Yeah. Well, and I'm the, I can become the listing agents who too, right? Like, you know, Hey, you know, Jason, yeah, I know that you've got a reputation for getting deals done. Um, look, if you can get your people to seven seventy five. We'll just accept it and move on. Like, all right, give me five minutes. I'll call you back. Right. And then, but that's a, that's the, that's a, that's the, you know, authority, the trust, the empathy, all of it coming together with the clients. Authority and empathy. They're and the I'm not, and I'm also, the guy. Notice how I'm that always started with the question. You're not what? I'm not spending them over either. Like, I, I will be straightforward. Oh. I wouldn't pay that. Oh, exactly. It's, it's about, it's, but that, that's huge. Um, I have, you know, so often, and we all know this, but it's so good to be aware of it is we assume what we want, you know, we go by that treat other people the way we would want to be treated, but let's put that into context. I want to be served for what, for what, my, for what my goal is. I don't want to be served for what your goal is. The client wants to be served for their goal, not our personal goal or our personal taste in a home. What is their goal? What are they looking for? What is important to them? They are living from where they are. Thank God, because if we were all the same, the world wouldn't be nearly so fabulous as it is. Or so I was, I was, coaching, might say worse, but. I was coaching an agent one time and we got into a heated discussion that I thought he was completely wrong about. Um, and I still feel that, oh but it was about um, representing a buyer and like helping the appraiser. Right. And his take was, and this would have been like pre anything pre COVID, but his take was, why on earth would I ever help an appraiser to get to a number when I'm representing a buyer? And I looked at him and I said, because you, you're assuming. Because the buyer wants to close. You're, you're assuming that the lowest number is what the buyer wants. I mean, really, they might just want to buy the house and move exactly. into Exactly. And not, not blow up. That actually, bl- I don't even understand that because you lose houses over that kind of stuff happening. Well, there, there are, there are people that, that 
believe that, uh, see, I, I believe that, you know, in real estate, we are, it's a collaborative competition, right? So you're definitely oh, yes. competing against other agents in the marketplace. Um, but we're also brokers, which means we broker deals. So we do need to be collaborative, right? I need to, I need kind to have to. There are other people that believe in scorched earth, right? Like that they're going to just be, you know, have a disastrous approach to anything. And they don't get deals in competitive situations. Yeah, well, then that goes back into paradigms. Like what paradigm do we live in that we think that to create extra drama, to give ourselves something to fight for and make it more difficult creates value by the virtue of, I'm a big believer in working hard, but working hard for an outcome and is necessary, not working hard for the sake of it. Well, yeah. Like, and does, does the drama, and I'm, I'm kind of, but like, does the drama of making a deal difficult make you more valuable? Well, I mean, you've heard the the saying, right? Somebody who's always putting out fires might just be an arsonist. <laughs> no, I haven't. Sorry, I haven't. That is, no, I haven't. Yeah. And that's what we, and that like, right? And realtors, that the best real estate agents, the irony, the best real estate agents are the best problem solvers, truly, and not always the best. You've got to be good at systems or God knows you better honor them and get somebody who is. But really great brokers are great at seeing an impossible situation and seeing the path to a solution that most people can't see. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. I'm going to go backwards for a minute talking about the yellow light. I just have to say this again for everybody. There are four parts of it. Listen, pay attention, ask questions. And then in that honing in on the ever present value that is so easily forgotten of pausing to go back to the listening to the answer to the question you asked and silence pause listen to people ask the question and give them the space to answer or give conversations the space for the other person to bring to the table yeah and, re and that is recognizing us as the guide right not the hero but well, yes. And then so along those lines, here's another like trick that I've learned. I don't know if trick sounds like I'm tricking somebody, but you know, so um, what would be your ideal timing? I don't know. If you did know, what would it be? <laughs> right. Like that seems to work 90% of the time. Isn't that amazing? You've got to just ask it. It's really in asking the questions. And back to the question I'd asked you earlier was, I remember just having this moment of in our in my business is we're so attached to getting the deal that we forget our real job is to align and meet that client where they are and asking these questions in a way where we can pause and listen and really understand where the client is and meet them where they are and giving them their business. I mean giving in, in serving their needs, which gets everybody business. That pivots me actually back into this art gallery. Because that's a little bit of what you've done with the art gallery. So give us a little bit, or what can you tell us? So you've got a real estate brokerage. You also have an art gallery and I think it's a part or it's attached to the brokerage, but that give us a little bit about that, because I think that is so cool and getting a vision of what your business is and how it serves your client creates opportunity and all of the fun stuff. Yeah. And so the, the art gallery was just, it was a, what I call a strategic byproduct. So what I wanted to do, and some of this gets philosophical, but when I launched my boutique brokerage, um, I wanted cool space, right? And so I think of, I think a lot about space and real estate because it's what, what we do. Um, but I think that when it comes to the brokerage side of things, you can operate your space in one of two ways. And I think the in-between is probably the only wrong way. One way is you find like the least expensive space you can, you know, stand to be in and rent it or buy it or whatever. And so then it's just a, it's a, it's a housing cost, right? It's a low price per square foot. Or you can use your space for marketing purposes, right? And that's where you'll see like, you know, businesses will have like their marquee sign or whatever. Um, we're on on Main Street and and our downtown, and we're in um, Carmel, Indiana. It's a you know one of the more affluent towns in the in the Midwest, and our Main Street is um, quintessential. And they have international art and international art fair, and 
um, car shows and they do like uh, they close down the streets a few times a year. So there's always stuff going on. Um, so I bought, you know, it's just really good luck um, uh, in art gallery. It was a public private partnership and technically the building is a condo. So it's a four story uh, um, building and I own the, the first floor, but I wanted to, and they call it the Carmel Arts and Design District is our main street. And I wanted to preserve the integrity of the Arts and Design District. So, and I really, honestly, Jerry, I just thought it'd be cool to have a real estate office in an art gallery. Tall ceilings, exposed, like the art gallery lights, you know, white walls. We've got a, I'll send you pictures because um, they're online somewhere. Um, this hand carved limestone fireplace that looks like it's, you know, out of like Bruce Wayne's house. Um, wow. The lady that used to curate for the art gallery uh, approached me and said, hey, um, we've got all these artists and they want to still display and sell art. And I'd like to work it on special events and Saturdays. And I was like, well, let me get this straight. You're going to put a ton of artwork in my office and I get paid when it sells. Okay, I'll do that deal. And uh, that so is really cool. I, I don't, I, we've been doing it for uh, a year and a half now. I don't have it all figured out, but here's what I know. Where do you hang art in houses, right? Who buys art? Well, affluent people buy art and homeowners. Especially when they just bought a house. Yeah. So we've, we've staged houses to brought in a, uh, you know, piece of art or two on like a super spectacular wall that, you know, basically costs us nothing to do it. And, uh, you know, it can sell with the house. Uh, but we've had a ton of uh, client events because, it's a, you know, a really, really cool space. And I've got people have leased it out for video shoots and photo shoots and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so there's two ways. I love what you said earlier too. I don't want to bypass that. Well, what you, the, what you landed on is there are multiple ways to leverage your business. And in there it's what really, really comes to light for me is what you're doing is creating a special experience for your client, a special atmosphere. It, sure, it's marketing, but in that marketing, it creates us an experience for people and clients that nobody else is doing and nobody else can. Oh, yeah. And we, so here's a, here's a perfect example. Um, and I mentioned one of these guys earlier, but like a financial advisor that I work with, he's my number one referral source, not the uh, first guy I was talking about. Um, he had approached me, this started, so we did it this year for the second year. And again, we're on Main Street. He's like, let's have a, a, a homecoming parade party at your office. And I'm like, okay, cool. Right. He invites all Let's his clients. Let's bring clients to you. <laughs> he invites all his clients. I invite all my clients and the, the homecoming parade, we have a huge high school. It's like, I think 6,500 kids and it's just a massive institution. The homecoming parade isn't that, that special. Right. But we have probably 200 people here drinking and eating all day. It's turned into this, this huge thing. And they're, they're the right people, right? Like some of them are my clients and the other ones are people that I'd love to be clients. And it, right, know who those people are. And something you said, it's funny too, because what that what you're talking about is what the experiences you're creating and what you're leveraging to bring the right people to you is really relatively in a, a lot less expensive than it would be to otherwise to do the, the same thing had you not created this real estate for yourself. But then you said earlier, there's two ways to do it. You can be the cheapest or you can be the best. You can, you can just do it because it's a necessity or you can do it to create the marketing. And I would add to that, create, be the best, create the experience. But it, it goes into, if I'm making sense, price and cost, right? Like the price of cheap real estate, what is the cost of what you lost? Unless that's your, how you do business, like you're the Walmart, or are you, the best you get the best real estate are you the best of everything because that's where you're actually spending less money to create drastically better and bigger experiences and better potential clients and future clients for your business yes um it, absolutely how did i hear it said it was a uh, um steve uh, uh from real trends but he he used to say um be walmart or be Nordstrom. Don't be Sears or JCPenney. 
and they both went out, did they go they went out of business didn't they? so or yeah. restructured in some or way but yeah, I mean, right. it, that's his point and you know you're you're yeah so the real estate broker stuff i don't always get like the class a office space now in in miami and certain in new york like that's kind of what you need but you know in more um uh suburban areas it gets a little uh tricky but what happens is like the price per square foot conversation i know everybody has it with their clients it to me it is so so evident when you start talking about a hotel Right. Mm. Like we were in, I, I spent, you know, way too long because for some reason traveling takes me forever to shop it, but, you know, shopping for hot hotels for our family to go to Manhattan a couple of weeks ago. Right. And there's, I mean, you can, you can stay for 70 bucks a night or you can stay for $1,200 a night. And it's like, the differences are, are obvious. Right. And so I think from a price per square foot standpoint, that's a good analogy to use with your, your clients. Or the one that I love is, um, you know, price per square foot is equivalent to price per pound in a vehicle. Well, right back to experience. Yeah. I mean, then use, use wow, that was good. Price per square foot. is like scrape price per pound in a vehicle. Yeah. And so not all, not all dollars are equal and, you know, use it in your, I think the biggest, the hotel analogy is great. Cause it's one of the biggest frustrations I have in our, in our business is that everybody knows the difference between like, um, a Conrad, a Hilton, and a Hilton Garden in Spring Hill Suites, whatever it's called, right? Like it's service, thread count, checkout time, room amenities. But in real estate, like not everybody knows the difference between the, you know, a boutique brokerage, um, a Sotheby's, a Compass, a Coral Banker, a Keller Williams, Right. And, and by and large, people charge consistent fees. So you really do need to address that and set yourself apart. Well, it was with it. And if you look at homes, it's the same thing as an agent understanding the difference, because sometimes your clients do and don't know, but ultimately they either figure it out or it costs them. I can't like if it reminds me of builders when you're in a market or, you know, sometimes a builder has been building houses for a long time. will decide to build luxury. He's been building, you know, small homes or, track homes or whatever, and then just builds the same thing bigger in the right part of the city. And suddenly they don't understand why it's not a selling. Cause yeah. that's where it's not just, it's, it's square foot sizes and everything. Did you ever read, um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book? Um, I think it's. Outlier. Tipping point. No. Outlier, outliers, it, outliers, it, yeah. Outliers, the ones where he talks about the thin slices. Maybe. What does he say? I don't remember the thin uh, slices. I think the story he uses is somebody, you know, a, um, a, a museum curator, like, can tell that a, a statue's fake, but can't really explain why. So the thin slices is that what you That might be that, tipping point, but go ahead. Go ahead. I think it's outliers, but once you have enough experience, right, you can, you can see things and you, and you know that something doesn't line up, but you can't articulate it yet. Right. I think it's your reticular activator that's working. Um, so meaning that like, there are things that you'll walk through a house and be like, well, you know, it just doesn't feel like a $2 million house. And you can't put your, you can't like articulate it right away, especially the first time, but then you start to notice mm, it's a different quality of window. Right. Or what something that came up the other day. Um, railings, things like uh, railings. The, uh, yeah. Railings. It was a, there was a, uh, somebody was like flipping a higher end house and like every single outlet receptacle was crooked. Right. And not like sideways. Crooked. Is it? A, well, that goes into, it is the smallest things in something, whether it's our business or the way home, like the smallest things, it's all in the details. The smallest things, smallest gestures that we make in our business can make, if you start looking at like, where have I gotten my best transactions? It's always been the smallest of details. It's yeah. in having that connection and, and it's in two things. It's, you've got to have that, whether it's the empathy or character component of remembering their name, knowing their kids' birthdays, those little things. And then on the competence, understanding the details of the market and being able to speak to it and, and strategize and create results around it in ways that other people can't. And anybody can do that, but nobody, not many people do. 
Well, and so I was thinking about this earlier and it just didn't come up. So I'll you know, bring it up now because I know I need to wrap up here shortly, but that's your brand. If you're an agent, I don't, I don't care. I, so I do believe that, um, uh, that, you know, your brokerage brand doesn't make a, doesn't make a significant difference. I mean, it's going to have marketplace reputation. Um, but what it does is it, it, it provides, you know, hopefully some tools and, and whatnot, but it provides uh, a pedigree to an agent, right? Mm -hmm. Whoever your, your, your flag is, that's going to provide pedigree and reputation. And that should, uh, you know, let somebody know um, what the experience is going to be like before they, they meet you, but your broker, right. Does matter. I mean, that's where, you know, that like, you know, some markets, Keller Williams is great. Some markets it's not some markets, global bankers, great. Some markets is not right. And that's kind of whoever's uh, running the ship, but so many agents feel like they need their own brand and it's, it's not the colors or the way you put your first initial and your second initial together. Your brand is how you show up, how you respond to text messages, how you respond to emails. Do you have misspellings? Do you use periods? Do you do it in a timely fashion? Do you set expectations, right? That's your real brand. Man, just like, let's mic drop that. That was that landed it. I always say your the the brokerage is the platform or the foundation, and yeah. the brand, and then the your, who you are and your brand shines from that. And if you're ever in a situation where you feel like you're being shadowed by another brand, then you either didn't have a brand, or you're not understanding how to use that brand as the foundation of your business. Which is huge when you look at like your business and the boot, like I always say the boutiques or the or the that like the boutique brokerages that are luxury like yours. Those are the, those are the brokerages that dominate. And in doing that, it's understanding how to leverage that as a foundation for any business that you build off but, of that. And, yeah. And that's, so it's easy to leverage that, right? You're a we before you're me, but I really, I can't emphasize enough that like, I will see agents spend more time on the colors of their business card and, um, their, uh, their, their photos and lifestyle photo shoots and whatnot, than like, how do we thoughtfully respond to um, uh, a text message or you know, handwrite letters? And, and it just it, it, to drive that point home even harder with you is experience is everything. People never remember what you did. They remember how it made them feel. Yeah. And that's experience and emotion. People remember experiences by the emotions they create, period, end of story. And that's where the power is. All right, we're gonna do the quick, we're gonna do a quick final three and close this out. This has been way too much fun. I love talking to you. Um, question number one is as you look at your business over these years, what has been your greatest resource for your success? Um my clients, um, helping them get what they want, and then them in turn helping me. Um, really just staying close to staying close to them so that, you're, so like, business, like people say there's business development service delivery service delivery is the best business development that you could do yeah so here's a here's a great example like i i pulled aside to a client one time and uh, i bumped into him and he's like how are things going i'm like look man this is a few years ago i'm like we're killing it like we've got the highest average sales price you know nobody's done more um multi-million dollar houses in Carmel than we have um but i'm not I'm not like, I'm not good at taking out the postcards and sending that to people. And he was like, listen, Jason, you just keep telling me that stuff and I'll make sure the word gets out. Right. So that, that's what I mean. of just like keeping your, your people close. That's awesome. Question number two, if there is a book, if you had to name one that we've got to read, whether it's changed your life or career, what comes to mind? So I'm going to go a little unorthodox with this um, mm -hmm. right now. I, I and I'm going to give you two because I don't know. Um, I don't know the one you could still get, but this book that I read, uh, Tom Peters, The Pursuit of Wow, is old. Like you probably have to find it at half price books. And it's just a bunch of little sentences, really, and some paragraphs. Oh, fun. Uh, yeah. it, but it's fantastic. And I love, um, uh, uh, Ryan Holiday, 
Um, uh, stillness is key. That's the one. Oh, I like the name of that. And I know I've heard about that one. I haven't read that one either. Stillness is key. Is that yeah. like, that's it. What's the big takeaway from that one? Just that it's about like the stoic philosophy in terms of, um, you know, using your, using your, uh, perceived weaknesses as benefits. Hmm. That's going to be a fun read. Um, I will be, I think I might be reading that one next. All right. Last question of everything that we've talked about today. If me and everybody listening for only going to remember one thing, um, what would you hope that that is? Um, that I think that the theme that wasn't talked about is, you know, being a good practitioner is better than being a good prospector. And that's, and by practitioner, I mean, like really understanding the, the real estate business and understanding what, what drives your specific, you know, buyers and sellers, wants, needs, desires, you know, what, what had them call you and don't be, don't be afraid to ask. Right. So a part of that stoic philosophy is that, you know, you might think it's a weakness that we don't know the answer to all the questions, but the th strength is being able to ask the questions and find out the answer and build rapport and relationship. The strength is in the strength is that the strength is in being able to ask the questions. Sure. So you can go in, you can go into a listing interview and be nervous that you don't know all the answers. Maybe the house was in the MLS. You don't know who the builder is. You don't know anything about the people, but the, but like, and that, that can make you nervous, but what the strength is, is being able to ask all those questions. When you're listening to ask questions, you listen so much better. I have found that personally. Jason, you are so fabulous. It's so awesome to talk to you. Thank you so much for being on the show today. It was so, awesome. like, it was so much fun. So guys, thanks for listening. No, go ahead. No, it's a blast. I, I, I love being here and I love catching up with you. You too.